The Pacific Crest Trail, Trinity Alps, California, 1977. I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail from the Mexican border to Canada, April 2nd through October 11th, 1977. When I got in the Trinity Alps, I feel I was followed for several hours by an animal. I camped by a creek in the late afternoon and was cooking dinner on my small Optimus stove. I heard what I thought was music in the distance and low voices. Though I was several days from an active road, it freaked me out enough that I packed up and hiked all night north on the Pacific Coast Trail on a full moon night in late August 1977. All night I could hear branches and limbs breaking on the main ridge above me a few hundred yards up the hill. Then, in the morning, I crossed a small creek where there were some huge tracks sliding down into the creek itself and then up the other side. The only track that was clear was situated in the small sandbar. I hadn't seen anyone for three days before or three days after this on trail. There had been no signs of life. If this was a hoaxer, they sure worked hard to pull it off. And at night? Photo of the creature's track and my foot next to it. The last photo is of Rex Williams' cabin, just north of the Feather River, six miles north of the Feather River and the town of Belden, California, on the Pacific Crest Trail, where Rex built his cabin on his gold claim in the 1950s. He panned the creek each year for six months and had an outdoor kitchen. Old Rex Williams claimed a Bigfoot would come every few years. He had many bear stories and a few local bears that were a pain, but the Bigfoot would hit only every few years. Rex was 68 years old in 1977 and lived in Salem, Oregon during the winter. Strange Tale of Bigfoot Female Bigfoot Captures Railroad Linemen Early 1900s I was told this story 20 years or more ago by my mother, who passed away in May of 2006. It came up in conversation during which we were not discussing Bigfoot, but she retold a story that my grandfather had told her and her siblings 65 or 70 years earlier, roughly 1916 to 1921. My grandfather and grandmother were Greek immigrants that worked in the fruit canneries in the Valley Central in California, and my grandfather worked many years for the Southern Pacific Railroad doing track maintenance and building track. My mother told me a story that was refuted by her and her siblings when my grandfather told it. These were children of the early 1900s, going to school bi and trilingual. As my mother told it when Grandpa told the story, they were convinced that he was telling a tall tale, primarily because they all learned in school that there were no apes in North America. The story goes, Grandpa was working for Southern Pacific Railroad, building track in the Northern California-Oregon border area in the early 1900s. I do not know the year. During this work project, he was dispatched to work on a line camp in the woods. They had a base camp that the work crew worked from, and each week the work crew splits into two two-man teams that would work an area clearing logs and ground, and at the end of one week they would go back to the base camp to check in and replenish their supplies, and then set out after the weekend for another week in the woods. During this time, one of the two-man teams came back to base camp with only one man. They were told the other man had disappeared. The group at the base camp apparently gave a brief search to no avail. The next week, the crews went out in two-man crews and continued the work on the railroad line clearing. Some weeks later, I'm not sure how long this was as the camp moved north, and the group of workers came upon the missing man. He was naked and hysterical, crazed, and apparently died soon after he was found. He told of being abducted by a female ape that kept him in a large open pit. During the time he was in the pit, the man told of being forced to have sexual contact with the ape many times, and said that the ape kept him in the hole or pit by licking his hands and feet raw, so he was not able to escape from the pit. Apparently, my grandfather saw this man's hands and feet and said that they were completely raw. My mother and her sisters and brothers laughed at my grandfather as someone who was uneducated and unable to understand that this was impossible due to the fact that there were no apes in North America. I always found this to be an intriguing story. Has anyone else reported a similar story? John Lewis 
Horse Camp, Mount Shasta, 1990s. I was an assistant caretaker with the Sierra Club Foundation at Horse Camp on Mount Shasta during the early 1990s. During these off days, we usually saw very few people at Horse Camp who would stay the night and climb the mountain the following morning. Normally, day hikers came to visit and look around, but then went back down before sunset. It was a Thursday, and I was waiting for R.W. to come and relieve me so that I could go down to Shasta City to take a breather, get some food, and find a shower. R.W. was typically late, so I decided to retire once I realized he wasn't going to show up. I don't remember what stage the moon was in, but a faint glow of light was present so that I didn't need to rely on my flashlight to get around. It was shortly before midnight, and I was in my tent which I had set up less than a hundred feet northeast of the horse camp hut. The area is a mix of stones and paths leading to other campsites and other trails to explore the mountain. After settling down for the night, I heard someone walk around the hut as stones clanked against one another. Knowing that R.W. was a big prankster, I yelled out his name a couple of times, but no response. Keep in mind, I spent a lot of time and nights alone on Shasta, so I never had anything to worry about, which means that I was rarely fearful of anything. When I got no response, I started to go off pure instinct, and the chain of events became vivid. The walking sounds were getting closer to the left side of my tent, and thinking about how vulnerable I was, I grabbed my ice axe in my right hand and slipped out of my sleeping bag, poised to open the mosquito flap if anything was going to go down. My heart raced and the adrenaline was pumping through me. Out of the left-hand side of the mosquito mesh door, I saw a huge outline of what I believed to be Bigfoot. The outline walked about 30 feet in front of my tent, stopped, turned, and stood facing me. At the time, I didn't think Bigfoot, but rather someone was up here to cause trouble. So I ripped open the door of the tent and jumped out with my ice axe in my hand. I'm six foot three inches tall, and this being was much bigger than I. We stood there for a few seconds, and the Bigfoot turned away and slowly walked into the trees. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night, but just because of the spiritual and peaceful nature of Mount Shasta, I didn't question my safety, and life went on as usual, with my only regret being that I showed this entity such hostility by brandishing my ice axe. In hindsight, I believe the being was just passing through and meant no harm. I looked for footprints the following morning, but only found an area where it looked like something had a difficult time getting up a steep incline. I didn't smell anything since a small breeze was coming from behind me as we stood there face to face. I finished out the caretaking season without further incident, except for a group of thieving Boy Scouts from Sacramento. Michael Card Calaveras County, California in the spring of 1987, I was out at a friend's place in the boonies, about five miles from Mountain Ranch, California, in Calaveras County, in the Sierra foothills, at about the 2,500-foot elevation. I was there for several days mining gold in Salamander Creek, using a small suction dredge. The area isn't wilderness, but it's sparsely populated, heavily wooded, and very rugged terrain. My friend Jonesy is a character who I've known since junior high and he has owned his 90-plus acres since the mid-70s. Jonesy is uneducated, but definitely not dumb. He has almost preternatural senses when it comes to woodcraft and what comes and goes in the bush. I have learned over the years to take some of his stories with a grain of salt, but not to be surprised when something unbelievable that he has told me turns out to be true. For years, I had heard his tales about mountain lions, Bigfoot, and UFOs out on his ranch, and always nodded and said, Sure, Jonesy, I believe you. Over time, I confirmed the mountain lines, but I pretty much disregarded the other stories as bullshit, or products of an overactive imagination. His place is very conducive to such thoughts, heavily wooded mixed oak, pine, cedar, and dense brush in any open areas. Not a good place to try to venture anywhere on foot at night. On this occasion, we had dredged all day in the creek and were sitting around the fire bullshitting just outside his shack on the hill. Jonesy is a guy who will, if you spend enough time around him, tell you the same stories over and over again. I had heard about Bigfoot from him many times, 
and the gist of his tale was that Bigfoot guarded the gold mine that Jonesy knew was on his land, and he wouldn't let anyone find it. Well, I didn't necessarily disbelieve in Bigfoot. I didn't really take his story seriously either. We were both concerned about a local dirtbag sneaking in at night and messing with our operations in the creek below the shack, about 200 yards away and maybe 100 feet down. Gold mining engenders paranoia, and we'd take turns walking down there well-armed and checking things out. Around midnight, I grabbed my 12-gauge and headed down to perform watch duty, check on our vehicles and equipment. I had the gun because there are lions and bears in those woods, not because I seriously suspected to find anyone or anything that would require its use. It was an ink-black night with no moon, and I did not take a flashlight. When I got down to the creek at the bottom of the hill, I squatted down for several minutes and just listened. Out there at night, your hearing is about the only sense you will have to give you any information, and it's virtually impossible to move around and not make a racket. There was no indication of anything irregular after several minutes, so I lit up a smoke and determined to return to the fire when it was finished. Not long after I lit up, squatting there on the creek bank, I heard something crashing through the brush on the hillside above me, away from the shack. The noise came from an area which Jonesy called his boneyard, where there were 15 to 20 junk vehicles in a small clearing. It sounded like something big was literally tearing its way through the bush, snapping sounds of tree limbs breaking, and a kind of intermittent thud-thud sound like someone walking and stopping, then starting again. I knew the area well, and I knew that no person could walk through it like that, even in broad daylight. I snuffed out my smoke and went on maximum alert as whatever it was moved along the ridge until it was right above me in the pitch-black night, about fifty yards away. I figured it had to be a big bear. They were around and they were the only animal I could conceive of that could possibly explain what I was hearing. There was silence for maybe a minute and then there was the most unearthly scream I ever wished to hear in my life. I have heard a mountain lion scream and this wasn't the same at all. It started low and went higher and louder, ending in a series of woofing sounds. I've never heard anything like it, before or since. It made every hair on my head stand out straight, and my bowels went loose and I nearly lost control of that function. Then I was hit by a smell so foul it made me instantly nauseous. I was huddled there in the dark with the safety off and my shotgun pointed towards the sound for maybe another minute or two when the crashing and thudding sounds started again and headed back the same direction they had come. This time they were continuous until they moved away and then suddenly ceased entirely. I stayed where I was, shaking like a leaf for several more minutes. There wasn't another sound, but the foul smell lingered. Finally, I got up and slowly and as quietly as possible retreated back uphill towards the shack, stopping and listening and never turning my back on where the noises had come from. When I got back to the fire, Jonesy looked at me and said, What's the matter, Frankie? Did you see something? You look like you just saw a ghost. I poured out what had just happened, and Jonesy laughed and said, That was Bigfoot. So now you believe me, huh? The next morning, we both went over to the hill where I had heard the sounds and looked around. There was an unmistakable track along the hillside that looked like a rhino had just run through it. Small cedar and oak trees, four to six inches in diameter, were snapped off near ground level, and low branches on larger trees were broken and hanging down where whatever it was had passed through. The foul smell still lingered there. There were no prints in the forest duff, and backtracking the destruction, we came to the edge of the boneyard where all sign disappeared. This was and still remains the creepiest thing I have ever experienced in the woods, and although I never saw whatever it was that made the noises I heard, I am of the opinion that only a Bigfoot could account for what I witnessed. I'm not superstitious, afraid of the dark, or prone to imagining things. I have a lot of outdoor experience, and I know about all the critters in the woods, and this wasn't one of them. I know absolutely that this creature was aware of my presence, and the display I experienced was made for my benefit. It certainly worked, if scaring the bejesus out of me was the intent. To this day, I will not stay at Jonesy's ranch after dark, for anything. Frank Galt Weaverville, Trinity County, California, 1994 
A young grocery clerk in Weaverville, Trinity County, took me to a point at which he came upon a light-colored Sasquatch during the winter of 1994. It was not far from the Big Bar Ranger Station, where he and his girlfriend used to park and neck after work. Engaged in some heavy petting, they were interrupted by the rocking motion of his Chevy Camaro. They looked around, thinking it was one of their friends or other kids screwing around with them, but the windows were pretty fogged up and there was little visibility. Determined to confront the intruder, the young fellow bounced out of the Camaro, screaming, Knock it off! in a most assertive tone, only to find himself face to face in the pitch dark with a hulking figure he described as a bit taller than he was. Stunned, the kid backed up into the open car door, unable to move. He said the Bigfoot with his left fist wailed on the roof of his Camaro, beating it at least three times, but barely denting it. I heard it breathing. Man, I'm telling you, it was alive. Scary shit. I heard it breathe. The informant called to his girlfriend inside the car, in what she later described as three octaves higher than his usual voice, telling her to lay on the horn. Upon hearing the sound of the horn, the Sasquatch sidestepped backing away from the car and stared at the kid. I couldn't see his eyes or facial features, but it was clear he was facing me and looking at me. Even as dark as it was, he was only lit up by the car door light. The terrified kid said he got in the car, locked the doors, started the engine, and did a quick U-turn on Big Bar Dump Road. Amazingly, he said, the Sasquatch followed them up the road where it turns on to Corral Bottom Road, keeping pace with the car for several hundred feet before trailing off where they could no longer see it. I spoke with the two informants at J.C. Cafe in Junction City for more than two hours. Their account never wavered, and they still showed great fear in recalling the event. The female witness never actually saw the creature, but she heard its raspy breathing. It was evidently too dark to get much of a description, other than what he could see of the creature illuminated by the Camaro's door light. He knew right away what he was looking at, but in the shock of the moment, he was able to distinguish little. Responding to my question, did you see a reflection from its eyes in the car light? He replied, there was no color or light emitted from its eyes. There was no smell from the creature, and he could not tell if it was male or female, only that it was this humongous, dark, towering image that he could hear breathing quite heavily and with angry intensity. He said it kept pace with his Camaro to about 20 miles per hour, then it trailed off, but he wasn't sure of his speed. His girlfriend, amazed by it all, only saw a blurred image through foggy windows. A happy ending to this story, though. The young, amorous couple are now married and expecting twins. Trinity County, California, 1987 to 1989 Between 1987 and 1989, I worked on the USFS trail crew that cleared the hiking trails in the Yola Bali Wilderness. I can't readily remember our exact location, though I know I could take somebody there or show on a topo map. Anyhow, one evening after work while we were setting up camp, the pack mules started acting really skittish and were trying really hard to get loose. At the same time, we were hearing a sort of crackling in the woods that sounded eerily like a human walking through the woods, and there was a foul odor permeating the air. This went on for about two hours when it all stopped as suddenly as it started. I have not been back since, though even to this day I would like to go back and explore the location at which all this activity took place, especially since I have read about some sightings not too far from the exact location where we were clearing those hiking trails. This location was right next to the river, which had extremely steep terrain. This goes along with many other sightings I have read about in the area of the Yola Boli Wilderness. Paul Edmonds Bigfoot Sighting Between Weaverville and Big Bar, California, July 2009 Saturday, the 25th of July, 2009, I was driving west from Weaverville, California, on Highway 299. I passed Big Bar, and I guess two to three miles west of that Prairie Creek Road comes in from my right on my north side. It was about 8 p.m., just getting dark, when I had to slam on my brakes. Right in front of me, in my right lane, was what I thought was a big man wearing a big dark jacket. He was just standing there. He was about a 100 feet or 33 yards in front of me. 
He looked like he had come from the left, which would be the south side of Highway 299. He stood there for a second or two, and then turned and went back across the road into the trees. This was no man. It looked like a football player in pads. Big shoulders, thick body, not much neck, thick legs, kind of a hunch walk as opposed to an upright walk of a human. Arms longer than proportionate for a human. I couldn't see any facial detail. It only looked my way for a second, and it was in no particular hurry to get off the road. I'll say it took him seven or eight strides to get off the road and into cover, about twenty-five feet or so. I had my window open, so as I slowly pulled up to where he entered the trees, I whistled. I turned the truck off but heard nothing. I thought it might be standing still, so I got out of there. I have seen the Patterson film, and I have to say this was close to Patty. I saw no breasts, and I bet this was under seven feet tall, but about as thick. I have fished most of the coastal rivers for steelhead here, the Smith, Matol, Van Dusen, Klamath, Eel, Navarro, and the Golala River. I have heard of lots of stories and never fully dismissed the existence of Bigfoot. I just never had any reason to believe. We heard some screams at night a few times, but you always try to define those as made by a known entity. I know what I saw, and now I believe. Bigfoot is very real, and I'm getting the same giant goosebumps writing this now as I did that evening. He is out there. T.D. Additional comments by the witness. For now, I'll say he was six foot six inches. Having been an athlete all my life, I'd say 500 to 600 pounds would be accurate. Broad shoulders, which I saw momentarily as he turned from facing north, back eastward towards me, then south, his route into the trees. Head perched atop the heavy shoulders, arms thick, almost the same diameter all the way from biceps to wrist. A man's arms hang roughly to the top third of the femur. I would say his were to the middle third. Sun was going down, but I was facing west, so detail was murky. Fairly uniform hair over most of the body. Noticed a slightly bent leg at apex of step, like the paddy footage, but going in the reverse direction from my right to left, north to south. But I had to sort of self-hypnotize for some details. I probably only saw him for about 8 to 10 seconds. No facial features, though the eye area looked darker than the surrounding hair. Didn't see any nose or mouth detail. This is an incredibly harrowing experience. Even though I've heard stories and love the area, the first thing you think is, wow, this is really happening, and then your time is up. I thought after that, it couldn't be a hoaxer, as he seemed to walk at a leisurely pace. If I had a gun, I would have had ample time to take a shot. T.D. Willow Springs Campground in the Mount Lassen National Forest, Tahama County, California, 1977. My grandpa, my uncle, and I had been working in the area picking up sugar pine and digger pine cones for about three days or so, and had planned on being there for around a week. We were camped in a lower campsite in this campground, just off the main cinder road, coming by the camping area. I remember the camp was right next to the creek, and each night we would hear the deer coming to the creek to water, and would occasionally shine our flashlights and see them drinking. One particular night... We were sitting around relaxing, and I commented that it was strange that we didn't hear any deer in the creek. In fact, I don't recall even hearing any crickets or any of the usual nighttime noises. There was a group of people camped above us about a hundred yards or so up the hill, and they hadn't been there camping as long as we had. The three of us could hear the people in the camp talking and such. Then it was quiet. Suddenly, someone in the upper camp shouted, Hey! then some loud talking, and then this growl or scream noise. It was very loud and sounded as if it came from a fairly large animal. My uncle and I looked at each other, asking each other what the heck that noise was, and we looked at my grandpa, who was smiling and chuckling, which I found to be very odd, unless it was to cover up being frightened himself. My grandpa was a retired logger from Oregon. My uncle had also spent considerable time in the woods working as well as hunting most of his life. I had spent a lot of time in the woods, also hunting and working for my uncle, but had never heard a sound like that, nor had the rest of us. My grandpa said he thought it was probably a bobcat or cougar, but my uncle and I never heard any animal make that kind of sound, 
not to mention the fact that those animals will most likely stay away from a loud camp and may venture closer when it is dark and quiet. Anyway, while we were wondering what that first noise was, there began a lot of hollering and another loud growler scream from the upper camp. Vehicle doors slamming, and then the vehicle took off down the road, tires throwing cinders. They were out of there but fast. We, my uncle and I, were shaken up, but too proud to admit it to my grandpa. We didn't hear anything else from the upper camp. Nothing. I don't know if they left anything up there, how they were camped or anything, but I do know that they didn't come back. We went to bed as it was getting quite late, and I was so afraid to make any sound, fearful that it would hear me breathing and come into camp to investigate. We left a couple of days later, but I don't recall hearing the deer in the creek in the evenings after that night. All of the information given here is to the best of my recollection. As for the terrain, it was heavily wooded pine forest, quite a bit of brush around the creek area. The weather was warm during the day and cool at night. No unusual smells noted. Etna, Siskiyou County, California, March 20, 2009 On March 20, 2009, I was in Etna, California, and was directed to a beautiful drive around the Marble Mountain Wilderness on Highway 96. I was scouting the Klamath and Salmon Rivers for an upcoming trip. Edna is a city in the Scott Valley area of Siskiyou County, California. I stopped several times along the way and was traveling on 96 from Etna back west, north, then northeast towards Rika, my destination. It was about a mile past an area called Clear Creek, but before the town of Happy Camp, where I saw what I first thought was a large man crossing Highway 96 from my left to right. He was roughly 300 yards ahead of me. It was that time of day when the sun was setting, but still plenty of light to see clearly. Complete darkness would be in about an hour. I couldn't believe the size of him or it. He had to be six and a half feet tall, but thick. He was huge. I'm six foot four and 250 pounds. He or it was at least double my bulk. Long, thick arms with legs like a hockey goalie. His head was thick at the bottom, not much visible neck, and broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any detailed facial features. It looked my way as I approached, but he never stopped, crossing the road in a few strides. As I got to the spot where he crossed, I slowed. I saw him on the road for about four to five seconds as I drove up to where he was. I can tell you, I was in some kind of shock. My hands were cold, I had goosebumps, and my heart was racing. I've seen the Patterson film and grew up camping all over that part of the state. I've heard tons of stories read all kinds of reports, and really want to believe he exists, but I'm a realist. The view I had was similar to the profile of Patty. It would be nice to have someone find solid proof or a body, but at the same time, that kills some of the allure of the whole thing. I always had the fantasy of seeing one, and in these few seconds, those thoughts raced through my head. I pulled up slowly on the right side of the road, and there he was. I got a glimpse of him for about two seconds from only 30 feet away and up a hill a tad. When my truck actually stopped, he was gone into the trees and just seemed to disappear, that fast. The sight of this creature left me shaking and feeling queasy. I opened my door a tad and actually threw up. I can't overstate the shock and unease I felt initially. It's like everything you know gets turned upside down. The fact that I was there to see this, to be one of the lucky ones, was very overwhelming, but I was able to get out of the truck where I felt an immense calm. There was no fear, and I felt no sense of danger. I couldn't possibly follow it through that thick growth, and about three to four minutes had lapsed. I saw no distinct tracks in the pine straw. I crossed the road to where he came up and saw no distinct prints, but could see where he had stepped. I went back to my truck and stood and listened, but that was it. No smell, no sound, and I had no camera. My phone is just a phone. I sat in my truck, made a few notes, and just replayed the whole encounter over and over. I sat there for about half an hour, got myself together, and then drove on to Rika. One of the things I thought about was that with all the reports, all the sightings, is that if just one of them is real, then Bigfoot must exist. Could it have been a hoaxer? Sure. That's a good way to get shot, I'm sure, but I thought about it. An accomplice up the road a ways alerts the hoaxer, and he crosses far enough ahead to give little detail, but plenty enough to freak someone out. I figured that much could have happened, 
but it's hard for me to think some guy in a suit could have moved up the hill and through the trees easily. Maybe he just hung out up there, thus the silence, and could have given himself up had I had the guts to follow. I don't know. Seems like everyone up there has a gun, and you'd have to be pretty stupid or supremely confident to try and pull that off. From Al. Two stories from my friend Ed. Number one. I have a friend who lives in Montague, just south of Weed, California. He has had an encounter of his own. His name is Ed, and he's a kindly gent, the very salt of the earth. He wouldn't know a computer if he tripped over one. I'll be speaking with him tonight, and will transcribe and forward his sightings report. There were two, one in the Marble Mountain Wilderness, and one by Weechpeck, California. The Marble Mountain incident was a couple of years ago, the other in the year 2000 or so. Here's the first one. Weechpeck is in Humboldt County, in the Eureka, Arcata, Fortuna metro area. The community name derives from the Indian term for confluence. April of 2000, late afternoon. We were by Weechpeck, just across the river at the intersection of Tully Creek Road, Bald Hills Road, and Pine Creek Road. The two of us in a truck, panning for gold, fishing, and just enjoying the day. No fish, no color, but we had a great day. We had never driven up Bald Hills Road before. It zigzags a lot while heading in a generally west direction. A few turns up that road, my friend Mel stopped the truck and said, What the hell is that? while pointing to his left into the trees. There, big as life, about fifty feet away, was a large, hairy man. At least that's what I thought. Then I thought bear, but bears don't stand like that for long, and this was definitely more man-shaped. I've heard all the legends, but you never figure you'll be staring at a Bigfoot. I couldn't bring myself around to believe that. It was not as tall as I have heard, probably less than six feet, but had a stocky, thick build and long arms, perhaps a young one. It looked at us for maybe twenty seconds, then turned and walked further into the trees. We never felt threatened. We just thought he was as curious about us as we were of him. That's it. We got out of the truck and looked for prints and while there were footmarks, nothing that qualifies as a clear print was visible. Mel wandered a hundred feet or so into the trees, but retreated. We didn't have any guns with us, and we thought it was best to just get out of there. Mel knows an Indian man named Bo from near there. I believe he said he was Carrick, whom he called that night. Bo said there were many sightings by his people, and others in that general area. The Native Americans don't get as hot and bothered by Bigfoot as whites, he was calm and straightforward when he told us of other sightings. I know this was not a bear. I can't believe it was a man, because the hair and walking motion were so natural-looking. Suits wrinkle and hang funny on a person. This was all very uniform and real-looking. From Ed in Montague, California, May 2009. Story number two, and this happening in September of 2006. Four of us were camping in the Marble Mountain Wilderness after Labor Day and had pitched camp at Turk Lake. My friend Al used to be a guide with the Sierra Club, but now just hikes with friends and doesn't guide professionally anymore. While I was getting breakfast together, he was across the way a few hundred yards fishing. He came back to camp saying he heard someone or something moving in the, tree, in the trees behind him. He was uncomfortable and returned to camp. He ate, then all of us went back to where he had been and split into two pairs. I was with Barry. We went into the trees where Al said he heard the noise. Al and Kim went further north, then into the woods also. I suspect we were something like a quarter mile apart. We didn't know if we were looking for people, elk, whatever. Al just had a look about him. He never said anything about a Bigfoot, knowing I had seen one six years back in an area not too far from here, I had a feeling he didn't want to alarm anyone. We stopped to look around, as you can't be looking up while hiking in those trees, you'll trip up. So every few moments we would stop to look around. Barry and I were side by side when we heard what sounded like a shriek or whistle. It seemed to be coming from nearby. At that same instant, we saw a brush moving about 200 feet away, and for about five seconds, both of us saw the head, shoulders, and stomach of what I now believe to be Bigfoot. He was looking in our direction. It just froze in place. In a few seconds, he continued forward into more brush and then was gone. We could hear him moving through the brush for a few seconds. It sounded like he was really moving. 
Then it was silent, and we both sat for a second to gather ourselves. Barry was sitting there, head down, shaking, saying, I can't believe I saw Bigfoot. I can't believe I saw Bigfoot. I just can't effin' believe it. We figured if they were more dangerous, they might make a move on us, but they seemed to be cautious and not aggressive from what I have read and now seen. We caught up with Al and Kim and related our story. Al has been in many situations where he swears he heard them but never saw them. He has heard the grunts, screams, and what he describes a conversation between two creatures a couple of hundred yards apart near Bluff Creek. Every time I'm in the woods, I know I have a chance to see one again. Everyone in the woods should stop ever so often and take a good look around, not just near you, but further out. Ed in Montague, California, May 2009